The issue with discussing Marion's industrial history is, where do you start? The last time I did one of these programs, we started with the Paleozoic Era, when trilobites and other sea creatures donated their shells, their calcium carbonate, to an ancient seafloor, which became, after millions of years of pressure and heat, the blue and gray limestone that is quarried yet today here in Marion County. But even starting our discussion 500 million years ago really doesn't capture all that was necessary for Marion's industry to develop the way it did. So let's go back further. 13.7 billion years ago, the beginning of the universe. The Big Bang. No, not these guys. Without spending too much time on this extraordinary and mysterious Genesis event, let's quickly review. Cosmologists and astronomers agree that there was a tremendous and rapid expansion of energy and matter. How that happened, or why, is still an open question. But what we do know is that as the universe expanded, the elementary particles began to coalesce. Clusters of dust and hydrogen formed as gravity pulled this material together. The clusters became stars, and gravity organized the stars into galaxies, and the galaxies into galaxy clusters. Here, in this picture from the Hubble Space Telescope, we see the birth of new stars in the Eagle Nebula. So there you have it, cosmology in 90 seconds. These stars were and are fueled by gravity, compressing the star's material, raising the temperature enough that the hydrogen begins a fusion reaction, essentially the same mechanism as a hydrogen bomb. Fusing the hydrogen into helium, releasing energy as a byproduct. As the star runs out of hydrogen fuel more quickly for a large, hotter star, about 10 billion years for our own sun. We're okay for a while still, about five and a half billion years to go. In any case, as it runs out of fuel, the outward pressure of the fusion reaction decreases, but gravity continues, unimpeded, collapsing the star in upon itself, raising the heat even further. Fusing the helium into carbon and the carbon down the periodic chain to iron. The only place where iron atoms are produced is in the core of dying, collapsing stars. Finally, when the star reaches the iron core phase, it is compressed into a super dense, super hot sphere that can do only one thing, explode and become a supernova, spewing out its material into space where it might be picked up by other nascent galaxies and stars and solar systems and eventually planets like our very own Earth. It is those iron atoms, by the way, contained in hemoglobin proteins that allow us to be us, that allow oxygen to be plucked from the air and transported through our bloodstreams to eventually react with the chemicals we consume as food, releasing energy in the process, energy that allows our hearts to beat, our limbs to work, and our minds to think, process information, and create. Without those iron atoms born in distant stars, there would be no us here. No inventors, no thinkers, no entrepreneurs, able and willing to create a Marion, Ohio and its industrial heritage. So let's thank our lucky stars that we are here at all, enjoying this presentation. And why do we start here? Because it is also iron and its derivatives that fuel much of Marion's industrial history. It is iron, and through the Bessemer and other processes, that refine it into even stronger steel, out of which Marion companies and workers have crafted and formed some of the most complex and massive machines this planet has ever seen. So without that interstellar crucible, those exploding stars, we would not be here, and certainly the Marion-made miracles could not have occurred. So enough cosmology. Let's zoom down to Earth, as Carl Sagan called us, our pale blue dot in the universe. And this little speck on the dot that we call Marion. Let's go back only 200 years to that time the first settlers arrived following the Greenville Treaty with the Native Americans who were already here. The first product here was, in many ways, community, 
lines on a map dividing this territory into streets and lots that could be sold to people looking perhaps for a new start, a cheap homestead, a place to grow a family. Eber Baker was essentially an entrepreneur, a real estate developer, hoping to make some money for himself and his sponsor. Alexander Holmes of Newark, who'd bought the land and sent Baker here to develop it. Early on, 1820 and forward, the economic activity of Marion was primarily local. That is, individuals providing the things needed by the small but growing population of Marion. Lacking a water mill in the area, Baker set up a horse-powered mill to grind Marion County's grain, grain that could be used for food and other things. One of the first things that the local population and those who were traveling through our area along the Harrison Military Road needed was a place to lay their heads and stout drink to unwind the effects of the rugged travel that was standard in those days. Eber Baker, ever the opportunist and entrepreneur, decided he could provide some of those basic needs by first opening a rustic inn and tavern in a log building, ironically not far from where Trinity Baptist Church resides today. Later, he opened the old mansion house where, later yet, the Hotel Marion stood, and today is a parking lot at State and Center Streets. In addition to selling lots to homesteaders, Baker kept his new community well lubricated. That grain that his mill ground could be turned into whiskey. And in researching Marion's early history, I found that the father of our community was also its first indicted miscreant. This from Marion County's 1883 history, pages 356 and 357. The first case on the docket of Marion County is the state versus Eber Baker, the state versus the father of our community. The indictment reads, State of Ohio, Marion County, Court of Common Pleas, in the term of September, in the year of our Lord, 1,824, that is, four years after the territory was open to settlement, two years after the plat for the village of Marion is filed, jurisprudence has come to our fair community. The indictment continues, the grand jurors of the state of Ohio impaneled and sworn to inquire of crimes and offenses committed within the body of Marion County in the name and by the authority of the state of Ohio aforesaid upon their oaths present that Eber Baker, late of the county of Marion aforesaid on the 15th day of September in the year of our Lord 1824 with force at arms at Center Township in the county of Marion aforesaid and within the jurisdiction of this court did sell spirituous liquors by less quantity than one quart, to wit one pint of whiskey, to one David A. Town, to be drunk at the place where sold, to wit at the house of said Eber Baker, in said township, without being duly authorized, contrary to the form of statute in such case made and provided, and against the peace and dignity of the state of Ohio. Signed, M. D. Pettibone, prosecuting attorney. Milo Pettibone, by the way, like Baker, was a real estate tycoon. He laid out the village of Waldo in 1833 on 900 acres he owned, naming it for his fourth son, Waldo Pettibone. Waldo was killed in Culpeper, Virginia during the Civil War. Could it have been that Baker was indicted by a rival real estate developer, serving in 1824 as the county's first prosecutor, in competition with Baker for homesteaders, and perhaps the designation of his village as the county seat? Hmm. In any case, back to the indictment. This day came the prosecutor in behalf of the state, and the defendant being arraigned, pleaded guilty to the indictment. Whereupon it is considered by the court that he pay a fine of one dollar, together with the cost of prosecution. Despite his early brush with the law, Baker is described in Ohio Magazine's May 1907 edition as a generous phlegmatic personage who for 30 years enjoyed the favor of his fellow townsmen. It appears Baker didn't necessarily learn his lesson, however, or care to abide by Ohio's early liquor laws, because here is an 1837 warrant for his arrest, again, for running a tavern. 
I guess we've been a tough on crime community from the get-go. So Alexander Holmes from Newark, Baker born in Bowdoin or Litchfield Corners, Maine. Different sources list different villages for Baker's birth. In any case, there isn't much in either of those towns located a little north of Portland, Maine. Even today, the prospect of starting a new life out in Ohio might seem attractive given the remoteness of that area of Maine. This brings to mind a couple of ongoing themes in Marion's development, industrial or otherwise. That is one, much if not most of Marion's growth and success has its origins outside the community. It was brought in by people coming from somewhere else. Time after time, we'll encounter that set of circumstances. So outsider versus insider development is one theme, which is tied to another, that is serendipity. Very often these people land here and bring their ideas here by chance, without a lot of planning, more by accident than design. Once the serendipitous event occurs, however, then there may be a clear chain of events leading to additional initiatives and progress. But I find it interesting that a place's history can be so affected by seemingly random events. So let's start looking at some of them and trace their path in Marion and Marion County's economic life. In the 1820s and 30s, Marion was rustic. Building materials were trees, logs that had to be cut down from the native forest and applied directly to the walls of buildings. Floors were dirt. Industry, if you want to call it that, resided in these buildings and served the needs of primarily local citizens. Here's a description written by an elderly resident in 1879, recalling life in 1828. Our resident writes, on Center Street, on the lot lately belonging to Colonel Busby, John O'Hara had a long one-story log building, composed of three cribs or divisions, living in the east and middle ones and using the west one for a chair shop. Opposite to that and upon the north side of Center Street, where the pine tree stands in the front yard of Mr. Howard Copeland's residence, stood a low one-story log cabin, composed of logs of a larger size than the usual little buildings first erected along the line of the old war road, but with clabbered roof and in true pioneer style. It was occupied in 1828 by John B. Salmon as a cabinet maker's shop. Cabinet making, chair making, an early industry to feed the demand for some kind of furniture to outfit these rustic dwellings. That and whiskey making. Again, the recollections of our old Marionite writing in that February 1879 Marion Independent. This distillery was of the old copper worm order, and west of and attached to it was a horse mill to aid in the preparation of the mash, and on the north, that other necessary appendage, a hog pen. Within and in close proximity to the ditch, but separated from it by an open stone wall, was the well from which was obtained the water for the mash. This well was about five feet wide and four feet deep, and afforded the necessary amount of water for all practical purposes, as it was regularly replenished from the ditch. This establishment was under the supervision of the same John O'Hara that carried on the chair shop above mentioned on Center Street, but by another man as de facto operator by the name of Randall Tyler, the memory of whom doubtless still lingers in the minds of some citizens. Well, memories may fade, but citizens of the time remember their whiskey maker. And one can only wonder about the quality of the liquor produced from water emanating from a well fed by a ditch that runs hard by a horse mill and a pig pen. Perhaps the only way to drink the water was to distill it into whiskey of high enough proof to kill any contagion it might contain. Well, as the 1820s grew into the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, commerce grew to serve the growing population in and around Marion County. But still, it was mainly a local trade. Our 1883 history mentions a first warehouse run by Alton Gorton, later by S.E. DeWolf. Peter Mark manufactured the first bricks in Marion. A carding mill was started in 1835 by a Michael Kuhn carting wool into fabric. It was sold several times. Finally, to a Mr. Tovin, who, it is written, brought the first steam engine to Marion to run his mill. 
In the same place, he set up a screw press at the corner of Railroad and East Streets, where he pressed grain into linseed oil. The operation continued until 1855. There was a steam grist mill at the south end of the village, a sawmill on West Street, and a foundry and machine shop started in the southern part of the village by a Samuel Tillotson. By 1853, says our history, John Gurley ran a foundry and manufactured steam engines, machinery, and fixtures of all kinds made of iron and steel, including iron stoves needed for cooking and heating during the Ohio winters. Interestingly, Gurley and his wife Hannah also ran a 160-acre farm in Big Island Township, and in fact were the namesakes of Gurley Station, an enclave at what is now the intersection of Espyville Road and State Route 95. There was a rail station there and a post office. Today, nothing of Gurley Station remains. Gurley Avenue, however, in Marion is named for him. Part of what held up manufacturing was a lack of banking, wheat exchange for goods, and vice versa. There were so many changes in value, so many expenses and risks, says our history, that few merchants succeeded in the early days. The first attempt at banking in Marion came in 1839, when James S. Reed, his college classmate, Dr. Henry True, and R. H. Johnson raised $30,000 in capital and began lending that money to cattle dealers, who sold their cattle in New York and repaid Reed and Company with interest. Any Marion County banking prior to that was done in Delaware or Sandusky. J. S. Reed and Company became the Marion County Bank. In 1851, Judge Josias Bowen, born in Oneida County, New York, started the Bank of Marion, which became Marion National. Five years later, Bowen was appointed to the Ohio Supreme Court by Governor Samuel Chase. In 1871, Timothy Fahey started a private bank with $12,000 in capital. Savings banks and outside banks followed so that by 1907, Marion's combined banking capital was a million dollars, with over two million dollars in deposits. Local banking gave Marion companies credit to expand and a standard rate of exchange. Business was also conducted slowly in those early days. What couldn't be consumed locally had to make its arduous way into a wider world. Wagons made the slow trek to Lake Erie with grain harvested from Marion Fields, each with a driver, horses, needing to spend days and nights moving products slowly and inefficiently. Other towns, Bucyrus, Mansfield, Kenton, and Delaware, got rail service in the first half of the 19th century. Marion had to wait until 1852. August 28th, to be exact, when, with prominent Marionite Howard Copeland conducting, the first train of the Bell Fountain and Indiana Railroad rolled into town along Mill Street, carrying mixed freight. It wasn't long, however, before many more railroads arrived in town, fanning out in all directions, connecting Marion and its farmers and industry to the rest of the country, if not the rest of the world. Marion companies could finally begin to scale up with markets beyond local borders. Many Marionites became stockholders in these new railroads. In fact, Marion would develop into a major rail hub as the Erie Railroad acquired the east-west route through town, the former Big Four, and Marion became the largest hub on the Erie system between New York and Chicago, even adopting the name Little Chicago. The Erie's engine repair facility on the west side of town employed thousands over the years. Marion became a significant hub for passenger traffic as well. Marion's Union Station was built in 1902 at the union of several major lines, the Chesapeake and Ohio, the Cleveland, Cincinnati, Chicago, and St. Louis Railway, and the Erie. During Harding's presidential campaign, the station was critical. In bringing in reporters and sending out news from Harding's front porch campaign, Passenger service ceased in 1971. Among the definitions of manufacturing is taking something from the earth, refining it in some manner, and making it into a useful product that could then be sold. 
And so, one of our earliest products, and it remains so today, is the limestone that sits beneath about two-thirds of our county. As early as the 1830s, Marion's early pioneers were discovering this rich vein of stone, sometimes only a few feet below the surface. One of those was Nathan Peters, originally from Baltimore County, Maryland. He was elected Marion's first mayor. He mined the blue limestone just south of the home he built out of it on the southeast side of town. Bluestone Manor remains on Mount Vernon Avenue today. Peters died there in 1888. But the hole he dug remains just east of South Greenwood Street. Peters went on to purchase a thousand acres, run a bank, and became one of Marion's successful early citizens. Another early quarry was dug by Christian Haberman in 1857 at the tender age of 28. Haberman was born in the German or Prussian state of Hesse in 1829, one of 11 children. Unfortunately, his father died when he was two years old. Christian had little schooling, but at the age of 14, he apprenticed to a stonemason. When he was 23, he and several of his siblings came to the United States, landing in New York, and then coming west and settling here in Marion. The story is told in Marion County's 1883 history that Hopperman was vexed at the rabbits who were nibbling the young apple trees he was trying to grow several blocks north of the current courthouse. Chasing a couple of them, he saw them disappear down a hole between two rocks. He must have really had it with those rabbits because he started digging, trying to dig them out, perhaps with the thought of some rabbit stew that evening. Instead of rabbits, however, he found a lot of stone, blue-gray in color. With his training as a stonemason, young Haberman quickly forgot the rabbits and knew he was on to what could be a very valuable find. He quickly bought the half acre where he'd been digging and developed a quarry, where he returned his investment hundreds of times over. Haberman went on to become one of the leading stonemasons in Marion and surrounding counties. He laid the limestone foundations of many of the churches and other buildings in the city, as well as many bridge abutments in Marion and surrounding counties. He became very successful, sending several thousand dollars, which at that time was a lot of money, back to Germany to move five members of his family and their families here to this country. We don't know this as a fact. But I like to believe Mr. Haberman carried a lucky rabbit's foot with him from 1857 forward. Haberman and Peters certainly weren't the only quarrymen in Marion. There were holes punched in the ground all around our town. As this and other towns developed, as railroads and turnpikes were built, as streets needed curbs and bridges needed abutments, sidewalks needed installed, Marion's limestone was, and it is today, a valuable commodity. Many of the smaller holes dug around town were eventually filled in and built over, including Haberman's rabbit hole quarry. Others, the larger ones not still being mined, have gone on to host housing developments, become recreational lakes, and one on the north side of town became Crystal Lake, a highly popular swimming hole and amusement park during the early part of the last century. Randy Windland has written the definitive history of Crystal Lake Park, where Marion went to dance and swim and be entertained back in the days when those things happened in community with other people, not inside a television or a cell phone or a Zoom meeting. Owens Quarry, six miles south of Marion, and the Evans and the Norris and Christian Quarries on the northwest side of town produced, in addition to building stone, lime, spreadable lime, by burning the lower quality limestone. The lime was used to sweeten area farmland. It was out of these northwest side quarries that limestone was sent by rail to Chicago. Marion Limestone paved the streets and built the edifices of the 1893 Chicago World's Fair, the Columbian Exhibition, celebrating the 400th anniversary of Christopher Columbus's arrival in the New World. 
The exhibition became known as the White City because of all the white buildings and white roadways built of crushed limestone out of Marion's limestone quarries. Marion, in fact, became known as Lime City because of all the quarries in the area. Well, quarrying was not an easy or necessarily a safe occupation, particularly in its earlier days. Consider this headline in a 1912 edition of the Marion Star. Two men blown to bits in dynamite explosion. Whole city is shaken. The incident occurred at an Ohio and Western Lime and Stone Company quarry, which could have been one of several in the city. In this case, it says it was just north of the Garden City Pike, which is now Fairground Street, and along the Pennsylvania Railroad tracks, now the Norfolk and Southern Railroad. So it could have been one of the quarries in Quarry Park, or possibly the Ohio and Western Quarry that was destined to become Crystal Lake. Seems that the quarrymen were going to blast more stone from the wall of the quarry and had 250 pounds of dynamite on hand for the project. I am reminded here of the Darwin Awards. In any case, it was cold, so they had a fire going in the pit. This is pre-OSHA, remember. Someone had the idea that the dynamite should be moved closer to the fire to keep it warm. Perhaps it performs better at warmer temperatures. In any case, as fires do, it gave off sparks. Sparks carried by the cold wind to the pile of paper-wrapped dynamite sticks. Of course, the paper wrapping starts burning, whereupon the foreman yells, For God's sake, get out of here, run for your lives. But James Bertrand of Cottage Street, newly married and age 35, and an Italian worker named Mike, age 46, decided the danger wasn't that great, or they could put out the blazing dynamite and save the day. You have to admire the writing style and attention to detail in news reporting at that time. Our Marion Star reporter writes, Scarcely had they reached the spot where they had been working when the explosive let go, hurling them into eternity. The reporter goes on to describe an excruciating detail, body parts sliding across the ice, leaving a crimson trail, and a young boy on North State Street breaking into tears as the tremor shook his house, spilling his glass of water. Well, few, if any, of the later swimmers at Crystal Lake or those fishermen at Quarry Park today probably realize that the walls of those quarries were once splattered with the blood of unfortunate quarrymen. Much of Marion's industrial growth coincides with what is often termed the Second Industrial Revolution. Occurring largely in Germany, Britain, and the United States, this Second Industrial Revolution is pegged to the 40-plus years between about 1870 and the start of World War I, 1914. As so often has been the case, Marion was a microcosm for this period of rapid industrial growth. Industries grew on a wave of innovations in steelmaking, rapidly expanding rail networks, use of coal, steam, petroleum, a growing electrical grid, use of machinery, interchangeable parts, and more sophisticated management and manufacturing techniques. During this period, the Ohio Magazine in 1907 started a series to profile all of Ohio's major cities. In their editorial introducing the series to their readers, the Ohio Magazine said, It is appropriate that this series should begin with the present comprehensive articles on the city and county of Marion, Ohio, for Marion, while by no means a metropolis at this period of her growth, is typical of the very best qualities that have contributed to the greatness of the foremost American centers of commerce and culture. Even as early as 1907, before we had a president from here, Marion was being recognized as a forward-looking, successful community. We, I think, need to remember that and not fall prey to the easy melancholy that can come from the natural ebb and flow of markets and the local economy. While Henry Ford was perfecting the production line in Detroit, nascent automakers were producing cars in many other cities around the country, including Marion, Ohio, at least according to Wikipedia, 
Fred Titus was the proprietor of the Marion Automobile Company, which produced steam, electric, and gasoline-powered cars for about six years between 1901 and 1907, when the concern was sold to a Mr. H.D. Van Brunt and Mrs. Eunice Love. The car it produced was called the Marion, not to be confused with cars called the Marion made in Indianapolis, that's Marion County, Indiana, between 1904 and 1915, or the Marion Handley cars made in Jackson, Michigan, and the Marion Flyer made in Marion, Indiana. No discussion of Marion's industrial history, or for that matter, Marion's history in general, would be complete or even relevant without a thorough look at Edward Huber, who was rightly called the father of Marion industry. Huber, born September 1, 1837, was the middle son of Philip Huber of Wildorf, Germany. Wildorf is a small village in southwestern Germany about 50 miles east of the French border and 60 miles north of the Swiss border. Philip was a cabinet maker, skilled in woodworking. When he emigrated to the United States, first to Philadelphia, then to Dearborn County, Indiana, he brought his skills with him. Out on the frontier, he soon found there was more need for wagons than cabinets, so he switched gears and made a better living supplying neighboring farmers with wagons. Philip soon noticed his son Edward had a mechanical mind. He developed, for example, a new style of window sash as a young teenager. The Huber wagons were sent to a nearby blacksmith to have the iron parts installed, wheel rims, fittings, iron nails, and such. At age 13, young Edward wanted to see how it was done, so the blacksmith agreed to take him on to see if an apprenticeship would be appropriate. Well, in three weeks, young Huber had absorbed enough that he told his dad that he could do the work in their shop, and so he did. He became so successful, in fact, that the father-son team opened their own blacksmith shop. Edward, never complacent to accept the status quo, observed the robust inefficiencies in haymaking on the farms around him, from the cutting to the drying to the pitching into piles, to the pitchfork work getting the piles onto wagons, then the hay into the haymouse. It was all manual labor. There had to be a better way, particularly to get the dried hay piled into windrows to make it easier to pick up in the field. In his twenties now, Huber contemplated a mechanism that would do that, a revolving hay rake that, when dragged through a hay field, would fluff the hay into elongated piles, ready for harvest. Testing it on his family's farm, he started selling them locally. They were a huge hit. It was the beginning of a career that would track through nearly 50 years, result in over 100 patents, and be responsible for the largest share of community building in Huber's adopted hometown of Marion. How young Edward got to Marion is an interesting tale of romance, good fortune, and hardwoods. Here's the romance part. In 1865, Edward married Elizabeth Hammerley in Dover, Indiana. His new brother-in-law, Elizabeth's brother John, had married Edward's sister, Amelia. Amelia and John Hammerley lived here in Marion for several years. It was John who told Edward he'd find the kinds of ash and hickory trees here that would make the best hay rakes. So Edward and Elizabeth moved to Marion, more or less penniless. He worked as a blacksmith and talked to Mr. Knobble, who owned the planing mill in town, into letting him make his rakes in part of the mill. Knobble also let Huber borrow the tools he needed. If he could make just a dollar per rake he sold and build two rakes a day, Huber thought he could develop the working capital he'd need to expand. And expand he did. A year after Huber arrived, Mr. Knobble decided to retire, selling the planing mill to a partnership including Huber and his brother-in-law. The mill continued making the hay rakes, now over 400 of them. Huber oversaw that part of the operation. By around 1870, his other three partners retired, and Huber organized under the name Huber, Gunn, and Company. Five years later, he incorporated the Huber Manufacturing Company, taking over the previous firm's work, as well as the Holmes and Seffner machine works. By now, they'd made 200,000 hay rakes and shipped them all over the country.
The revolving hay rake gave Huber the idea for a revolving road scraper, which he patented. Huber took the scraper to the 1876 Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia, where it took first prize. He went on to develop a steam engine that could be moved by horses to run grain threshing machines. Then, in 1880, he put the steam engine on steel tractor wheels, calling it a traction engine that could move under its own power. Huber Industries was off and running, growing largely on the ingenuity of its namesake. They made threshers, separators, other kinds of ag equipment, equipment powered by steam, and later gasoline. Huber made the first gas-powered tractor in 1890, but it wasn't particularly successful. Impurities in early gasoline made the early tractor, like early automobiles, unreliable. Huber became disenchanted with gas tractors after 1898. The company wouldn't produce another until 1910, well after Edward Huber's death in 1904. By 1926, though, the company was developing what they called the Super 4 line of tractors, four cylinders with a unitized frame that made the tractor much stronger, and according to Successful Farming magazine, the gold standard in tractor design. No doubt because of Edward Huber's wide range of interests and talents, the company was going down at least two paths, agricultural equipment and road making equipment. The road graders led to other road-making machines, most notably a series of rollers that met the demand for newer, better roads as the age of the automobile dawned. Also, the company made the maintainer for many years. It was a multi-use, flexible vehicle that could perform multiple road maintenance functions. It became a staple for Huber manufacturing from the early 1900s through the rest of the company's history. During World War II, the government asked Huber to devote all of the company's capacity to road-making equipment for use all over the world by the armed forces making roads and aircraft landing fields. The war effectively ended Huber's run in agricultural equipment and, by some accounts, was the beginning of the end for Huber manufacturing. By the 1970s, Huber was sold to ATO Corporation. Production moved to South Carolina, where it eventually ceased. Huber's influence in Marion's manufacturing history is broad and wide, however. There was the Huber Steam Engine Company. At the time of his death, Huber was president of Marion Malleable Iron, later American Malleable Castings, Marion Implement Company, and Marion National Bank, a bank with some prominent customers. You'll note Florence Harding's signature on that check. Edward Huber was on the board of the Marion Oil Company, Marion Tool Works, Pendergast Lumber and Coal Company, a former president of Marion Electric Company, and he helped organize the Marion Street Railway Company. Huber wanted his employees to be well-educated, so he started the Mechanics Library that grew into the Marion Public Library. He wanted them fit, so he started the YMCA. He wanted them to own homes, so he lent them the money and formed the community's first savings and loan. To manage it all, he built a downtown office building at the corner of Prospect and Center that would later become the Euler Phillips department store, and eventually lofts and the home of latter-day downtown developer Lois Fisher. It almost appears as if the entrepreneurs who inhabit the building today, like Nathan's Barbershop, are channeling Edward Huber's entrepreneurial spirit, and even his distinctive look. Huber's generosity didn't extend only to his own employees, but to the entire community. He frequently partnered with young entrepreneurs, particularly those with good ideas. He was a partner with Benjamin Schertz, for example, of Marion in 1897, in development of a bicycle built for two, one of the hundred-plus patents bearing Huber's name. But aside from his own companies, perhaps Edward Huber's greatest contribution to Marion's prosperity was his backing of two cousins' ideas for a better steam shovel.
The foundation of Marion's iconic and signature industry, the Marion Steam Shovel Company, can be traced back again to serendipity coupled with an entrepreneurial spirit and the mechanical imagination to improve on the status quo. Just as Edward Huber had been dissatisfied with the way hay was stacked in the field and in the 1860s invented a revolving hay rake, so too was George King, 20 years later, dissatisfied with the labor required in the hot sun to pitch hay by hand into a hay mow. So he invented King's improved hay carrier that mechanically collected the hay off a wagon, moved it up into the barn, depositing it wherever the farmer wanted it. From Richland Township in Marion County, King sought the advice of the entrepreneur who was making the hay rakes, and by that time, lots of other agricultural equipment. Edward Huber, no doubt, recognizing an enterprising young man, similar to himself of 20 years before, liked King's invention and said it was worthy of a patent. Huber offered to put up the funds to acquire the patent for half interest and to give King space in his shop to build the hay trolley. Just as Huber had been helped by the Indiana blacksmith and Mr. Knobel here in Marion, who gave young Edward Huber the space to make his first hay rakes, King did a good business selling his hay trolleys to area farmers. After that first season, he went to settle up with Mr. Huber, but Huber said King wasn't keeping enough for himself, since he'd done all the selling and made all the wooden patterns, as well as any skilled pattern maker. So Huber took less, and within two years had sold back his half-interest in King's invention. George King later wrote, This was my first business experience with Mr. Huber, but afterward I was closely associated with him in business until the time of his death, and I always found him to be perfectly fair and just in his dealings. I found that no matter how much personal gain was at stake, he was always honest and reasonable. This is an exceptional trait and is found in but few men. Around that same time, Huber became involved with another young man, Henry Barnhart of Marion, who'd been operating some early excavating equipment west of town as railroad tracks were being laid. Barnhart was disenchanted with the machine that broke down often because, he thought, its swivel apparatus was at the top of the boom, throwing it off balance, and the machinery was too complicated, causing frequent mechanical delays. After operating the excavator, Barnhart, just like King and Huber, thought he could design a better way to get the work done, improve efficiency. Huber's reputation as a mentor to budding engineers was well known, so Barnhart, King's cousin, went to visit the namesake behind the successful ag and road equipment manufacturer. Huber, just as he had with King's hay trolley, saw merit in Barnhart's improvements on the current state of excavation equipment. Barnhart's idea was to move the swing mechanism below the boom, lowering the center of gravity, beef up the construction, and simplify the mechanics so all functions could operate off one pair of engines. Huber encouraged Barnhart, and like he had with King, offered to help him get his ideas patented for half interest in the patent. Like he had with King, Huber gave Barnhart part of his manufacturing space off North Main Street, just north of the Big Four Railroad, to make his first shovels. Huber was a visionary, not just for his company, but for his adopted community as well. He told George King, Marion needs you, and encouraged King to move into town, up out of Richland Township, and even share quarters with Henry Barnhart. King moved into the Barnhart home where Barnhart's daughters helped him write advertising circulars for his hay trolley. Huber knew that King and Barnhart would put their heads together on the nascent excavator business, and they did. With Huber as the mentor and financial backstop, the Marion Steam Shovel Company was incorporated August 4, 1884, with closely held capital stock of $50,000. In his 1915 autobiography and history of the company, George King wrote that in the beginning, the new company almost didn't get off the ground. The financial leaders in Marion discouraged the new enterprise at first, he said, until it started showing success. There was also the panic of 1884. King writes that Huber's personal credit saved the company numerous times. And the sales of two early shovels in Springfield and Sabina, Ohio, nearly flopped when weak parts broke. 
Barnhart and King were able to make repairs and get new parts, finally having the machines accepted and bringing home enough cash to keep the company going. The complete history of the Marion Steam Shovel, later Marion Power Shovel, would take many more hours than we have, so let's hit a couple of the highlights. The first two shovels were built in Huber's shop, the former Centenary Methodist Church, the forerunner to Epworth United Methodist, and later home to Houghton Sulky. They were mounted on rails and used in the railroad construction business, which was in full bloom. Marion also made ballast unloaders, invented by Barnhart, that distributed the ballast off rail cars onto the tracks under construction. Shovels were also mounted on barges, becoming dipper dredges that cleaned out harbors and canals around the world, this one in Urbana, Illinois. This one on the Ohio River in Cincinnati. And this one in Libau, Russia, showing the growing worldwide market for Marion machines. Shovels grew to include steel wheels. Then tracks. They grew to swing around 360 degrees, increasing their utility. An industrializing world needed coal to power all the machinery and heat workers' homes. Shovels became larger and larger, growing to become some of the largest machinery ever built. Marion Power Shovel's Mountaineer was the epitome of this kind of machine. It featured an elevator to get operators up the 20 stories to its controls. Starting in 1919, the shovel was asked to lend its expertise to the U.S. military and to produce a dozen unique long-range rail-mounted cannons. Using 420 pounds of explosive, the cannon could fire an 800-pound projectile 29 miles. That is, for example, from Marion to Lewis Center. One of those shots aimed from the Marion County Courthouse could have taken out the Alum Creek Dam. The guns were shipped by a special train because of their weight, over 270 tons each. The first one went to Washington and was put on display for the Victory Loan Campaign, then moved to Aberdeen Proving Ground in Maryland, where it was tested and reportedly worked perfectly. At least one remains at Aberdeen today. They were so heavy that they had to be mounted 38 inches into the ground on a special track. Aiming had to be accomplished by observation aircraft. There is no evidence the guns were ever used in wartime, as they were built post-World War I and pre-World War II, when advanced bomber aircraft could accomplish the same mission more effectively. A quick aside, I grew up about 17 miles from Aberdeen in the little town of Baldwin, Maryland. I can remember summer evenings hearing the dull boom, boom, boom of the big guns firing due east of our little village. And I wonder now if any of those were a piece of my future, beckoning me to Marion, Ohio. Post-World War II, as America became engaged in the space race, Marion played its role, developing two NASA transporters. They are still used at Cape Canaveral to move launch vehicles three miles from the vehicle fabrication shop to their launch pads. Those machines made in Marion are said to be the largest land vehicles ever produced by humans. Thousands of Marionites worked at the shovel. Many of them posed in the company's giant shovels over the years. In several locations around town, the company provided a significant portion of the community's economy, not just directly, but through hundreds of ancillary businesses that provided parts, dyes, advertising, legal services. And even culture, like the Shovel Chorus that performed weekly on WMRN during World War II. Note former county commissioner and, who knew, choir director Merle Lacey. But markets change. Decisions made for good reasons in one era may not serve as well in another. The Shovel's decision to focus on the large equipment end of the business was prophetic. A company that buys one of those huge machines may only buy one, ever. 
Improvements in hydraulics and diesel power made smaller excavators popular. The Mountaineer was built in 1955 and 56 and erected near Cadiz, Ohio to strip mine coal. Six years later, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring was published, kicking off the modern environmental movement, beginning a movement away from coal. Through a combination of factors, the shovel struggled. Foreign competition mounted. Cheap overseas labor challenged expensive union labor here. Capital equity firms bought out struggling companies. Mergers happened as markets contracted. Marion Power Shovel was acquired by Dresser Industries in 1977. What was happening here was typical of the industrial landscape, particularly here in the Midwest. In 1997, Marion Power Shovel was sold to rival Bucyrus International, with its jobs moved to Milwaukee. When I arrived in Marion in the spring of 1997, the last vestige of Marion Power Shovel was the parts warehouse on the southwest side of town. It, too, was soon sold and is currently the new home of General Machine and Saw. But the infrastructure that served the shovel remains and has been repurposed in numerous ways. Ted Graham, originally from Wichita, Kansas, saw value in these buildings and their capacity. Just as he did with the Army Engineering Depot on the east side, Ted bought the shovel properties at several different times. Ted poured in capital and improvements that make these properties valuable in today's markets. New roofs, new floors, modern truck docks brought these buildings into the modern era. On the south side, the Shovels Plant 2 has some of the heaviest lift capacity of any building in the United States. Those cranes that can lift 300 tons without collapsing the building housing them have lifted locomotives off their tracks and moved heavy industrial equipment. Today, the Shovel's south side buildings are employed by Union Tank Car as they retrofit and improve the safety of the nation's rail tankers. Well, as I'm sure you're gathering, Marion County's chronology of industry is wide and varied, and it will be impossible to do it all justice in the time allowed. But in the time left, let's explore some other interesting stories from both our more distant and recent pasts, as well as take a look forward. Marion City, of course, isn't the only place hosting industry in the county. In fact, virtually every village has hosted at least one major company, if not more. The village of Morrill, for example, was named after its settler, Samuel Morrill II, whose sons in the 1890s developed machinery that could husk and clean corn and remove the kernels from the cob, among other food processing chores. Eventually, they started a food canning business that, at its peak, produced 40,000 cans of sweet corn every 10 hours. Eventually, the factory was sold, and since 1963 has been the site of Morrill Chemical Company, a family-owned formulator of liquid and dry fertilizers. In recent years, the firm opened operations in Caledonia as well. Of course, the county's largest industry for many years has been Whirlpool, specifically the 1.1 million square foot plant just outside the city's western border. Coupled with the 1.2 million square feet of warehouse space just west of the manufacturing plant, the complex is the world's largest dryer manufacturing operation. Whirlpool Marion has a capacity of producing up to 23,000 clothes dryers per day. The plant employs about 2,500. Of the nine Whirlpool plants in the United States, the Marion dryer plant is one of five in Ohio. About a fifth of the power required to run the Marion operation is now generated by three windmills recently constructed north and west of the plant. The company has been adding advanced automation and has purchased the ground between the manufacturing and warehouse operations, allowing for further expansion. That ground was once occupied by a truck axle forging operation run by Eaton, Dana, and eventually Cypress Technologies before it was closed in 2009. Whirlpool took over what had been the Marion Motor Products plant in the 1950s, a plant that was managed by future Watergate personality John Dean's father. John Dean and his family lived on Brightwood Drive. The future Nixon confidant lived here in Marion for about seven years during his middle and high school years. 
In later years, he would write a biography of Warren Harding. One of the more interesting chapters outside Marion City is the development of the Prospect Fire Engine Company. Like Huber, Wilson Bohannon, and many others, Prospect's development as a center of firefighting equipment came from the outside. Sylvanus Watring was one of five children who moved, with their parents, from Stockytown, Pennsylvania to Prospect, around the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. Watring's acquaintance with C.H. Sutphin, who was a dealer in chemical firefighting tanks, led to his idea for a better way to prevent the soda water in the tanks from mixing with the sulfuric acid that caused the chemical reaction, allowing a firefighter to douse a blaze. In September 1906, Watring and Sutphin patented a lead cap for the sulfuric acid tank that was inside the soda water tank that would prevent spillage until the entire apparatus was turned upside down. That patent led to putting these chemical engines on hose carts that could be dragged through town by men or horses. As Henry Ford developed the Model T, Watring and Sutphin put the tanks on Model T chassis. The fire engines were refined and developed throughout the years. By 1929, Sylvanus Watring was 63. As the creative force behind the company, he knew the company needed new engineering talent. Enter James Keenan Hanley. Born in Detroit, Hanley grew up around fire equipment. At age 23, he was a mechanic on the Detroit Fire Department. A year later, he accepted a position as sales engineer for the Aaron's Fox Fire Engine Company out of Cincinnati. As luck would have it, he fell for one of the accounting girls, Jessica Vole. As young people do, they married on May 23, 1929. One problem, the company had a policy against employees being married to each other, so both were summarily discharged. Aaron's Fox lost two good people. Their loss was Prospect's gain. Hanley went to work for Prospect Fire Engine as a designing engineer. Well, the Great Depression spelled the end of the Prospect Fire Engine Company, but out of that bankruptcy, Mr. Hanley bought the assets of the company, including design rights, patents, patterns, dies, fixtures, and the parts inventory for $750. Eventually, 250 people worked for Hanley Engineering in Prospect. They made fire engines and the Prospect Air Porter, part fire truck, part tow vehicle for smaller airports. Later, answering the need for fire protection along rivers like the Ohio during flood periods, Hanley designed and built one of the first fire boats, testing it on the Scioto River in Prospect. Unique to its design was the fact that it was propelled without a propeller. The pump that shot water onto the fire also ran the water jet propulsion system. It was the precursor to modern day jet skis. It was also modified for the U.S. Army to be the Mekong River jet boats during the Vietnam War. In addition to its iron and steel industries, Marion County was replete with lumber companies from the mid-1800s to the late 20th century. In 1920, the Economy Lumber Company operated at 513 Silver Street in an area just east of the Norfolk Southern Tracks. The buildings were removed in the mid-2000s. The vestiges of the operation can still be seen in aerial photographs. J.W. Jacoby was president and also president of the local district of the Ohio Association of Retail Lumber Dealers. The first Joe Slancer worked in a sawmill in Hardin County in the late 1800s, but a few years after the Allen & Rush Lumber Company opened in LaRue, Slancer crossed the county line to join the firm in 1880. Ten years later, he owned the company, calling it the Joseph A. Slancer Lumber Company. His son, Joe Jr., helped his dad out and took control in 1902 on Slancer Sr.'s death. In 1910, Joe Jr. moved the firm to Marion, just south of the tracks at Greenwood and Wilson Avenue. He took over what had been the Marion Implement Manufacturing Company building. The firm started by Edward Huber to build his hay rakes and wooden tanks for the company's steam engines. Slancer Lumber and Coal operated successfully, building trusses for houses in the area, among many other lumber products, until 1947, when it was sold and became Lockwood Lumber. 
Joe Jr.'s son, Joe III, in the blue shirt, remembered watching the trains from the firm's second-floor offices, which is where he developed his lifelong love of railroading. Until he was no longer able, this is where you could find Joe III, holding court at his beloved Union Station. The third Joe Slancer recently died at the age of 85 and left the nearly $4 million legacy of his father and grandfather's business to the Marion Community Foundation, where it benefits Marion Union Station and Epworth United Methodist Church in perpetuity. The former Marion Implement Manufacturing Company building still stands on Wilson Avenue and is part of the Spectrum Cable TV operation that occupies the site today. In addition to economy lumber and slancer lumber, in 1920 there was Emerson Sash and Door, the H.C. King Lumber Company, Marion County Lumber Company at 611 Bell Fountain Avenue, started in 1916, and the Prendergast Lumber Company on Oak Street, just north of the tracks. The company split into retail and wholesale divisions, the retail becoming the Marion Lumber Company, and the wholesale keeping the Prendergast name. The Prendergast Company grew to have timber holdings and sawmills in many parts of the United States. One of its shareholders was Warren G. Harding. In fact, on October 26th of 1920, just before he was elected our 29th president, Harding was initiated into the Hoo Hoo Concatenation, a tongue-in-cheek society of lumbermen, ostensibly because he owned a few shares of Prendergast Lumber, but more likely because within days he would be elected president. Harding spoke on fellowship. Lumbermen from across the country came to Marion that day to discuss their trade and hear Harding speak. One other Marion Lumber Company deserves mention, Baker Wood Preserving Company. From 1880 forward, the company treated timbers with creosote, a mixture of coal tar and other chemicals, turning them into railroad ties. Here you can see the timbers ready for treatment and the heavy manual labor required to move them around. Runoff from the site on Holland Road ran into the Rock Swale Ditch and then to the Little Scioto River, just 2,000 feet downstream from Marion's water intake. In 1946, the Ohio Department of Health told the company to put in a water treatment facility. It didn't get finished until 1953, and five years later, ODH said it was still fouling the water. Eventually, the U.S. EPA stepped in after the site was abandoned, declaring it a Superfund site and funding a $7 million cleanup. The EPA report found a laundry list of chemicals in the soil and water, including five polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons at levels never seen before in the water pollution literature. Ostensibly, the site is clean now, although I took this picture not long ago, and it is for sale. Some of the quality lumber sold by these companies ended up as quality horse carriages, carts, and sulkies. For over 140 years, Marion was home to some of the finest horse-drawn vehicles made. It is another case of talented outsiders bringing their skills and ingenuity to flourish in Marion. Thomas J. McMurray, born in 1841 in Steubenville, Ohio, apprenticed as a carriage painter in Worcester in his early years, served in the Union Army during the Civil War. After stops in Kentucky and Orville, McMurray finally landed in Marion to establish a carriage manufacturing firm by the name of McMurray and Fisher. Their shop was in the 200 block of North Main Street. Meanwhile, in 1895, William H. Houghton arrived in town and the next year started a buggy business in the shop McMurray Sulky had occupied before they went out of business. Within a few months, however, Houghton re-established connections with T.J. McMurray and reincorporated the firm. Houghton was president, T.J. McMurray retained an interest, but retired from active management, retreating to his Florida home. In 1904, Houghton sold his McMurray Sulky interests and established his own firm, Houghton Sulky, moving into the former Gebhardt Piano Company building at the corner of George Street and Lincoln Avenue. In 1917, he acquired the patent rights and goodwill of the Faber Sulky Company of Rochester, New York. Faber Sulkies were considered favorites on the racing circuit.
By 1933, Houghton had also absorbed the McMurray Company and eventually was building vehicles under all three names. The company operated in several buildings. But its longest stretch was in the former Centenary Methodist Church, the old stone church that served the Methodists and the Catholics until it was converted into manufacturing space by Edward Huber and became the birthplace of the first Marion steam shovel. Houghton sulkies and show carriages were sold to English and Russian royalty, as well as the Ringling Brothers Circus. Houghton Sulkies were built in the old stone church until the firm was sold in 2007 to Gerald Sulky of Waterloo, Iowa. The Houghton name was again sold and the company continues today under new ownership in Lexington, Kentucky. One other note, during the early part of the last century, shortly after the First World War, the transition was well underway from horse-drawn carriages to the horseless variety. For a couple of years, at least between 1915 and 18, Mr. Houghton dabbled in the new business, no doubt as a way to enhance cash flow as a post-war recession was underway. In what had been the Marion Manufacturing Building on Leader Street, Mr. Houghton started a new company. It was the Houghton Motor Car Company, noted here in a listing of truck makers in a 1917 edition of Everybody's Magazine. The Houghton Motor Car Company made short wheelbase trucks and funeral coaches. There may have been an enhanced market with the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic underway. They featured a 22-horsepower, four-cylinder engine and were designed to compete with the funeral wagons that were being built on Ford Model T chassis. The effort was apparently fairly short-lived as the company returned its focus to horse-drawn vehicles. Some other more modern Marion County industries include J. Lenko in La Rue, started in 1968 by Ed and Nancy Murphy when Marion's General Castings Corporation needed sand cores. Ed visited a junkyard and assembled parts to make a machine to create the foundry cores. The business grew from North Prospect Street in Merriam to Morrill and eventually to its location on the north side of Leroux. The name is derived from the first letters of Ed's wife and kids' names. In Martell, it's bakery mixes, first as Pillsbury, then as General Mills, and now owned by Manel Milling, the company that supplies the plant with its flour. Not far from Martell in Caledonia and Iberia is Glengarry Brick, utilizing clay made from 370 million year old shale. Click on the link to see an interesting three and a half minute video on how bricks are made out of Marion County shale. In 1951, as the Cold War blocked 360 million years ago, it is what is known as the Late Devonian Period. A shallow sea covers much of what will become Ohio. There is no North America. The continents will soon be joined into a supercontinent we now call Pangaea. Ohio sits near the equator. The weather is tropical, steamy. Dinosaurs have not yet roamed the earth. Amphibians, the first vertebrates capable of coming onto the land, are just emerging from the seas. As the continents collide, mountains are pushed up where the Appalachians will be one day. Rivers flow from those mountains, carrying with them rock debris and silt, much as rivers do today. Where they enter the sea, they deposit their sediment into fan-shaped formations. The mud settles and is covered by more mud and compacted, and over millions of years solidifies into rock, shale. It is that 360 million year old shale that we mine today and reconstitute into clay that will form the bricks housing Ohio State Marion's new science and engineering building. What is ancient becomes new again. Welcome to the Glengarry Brick Company in Iberia, Ohio, on the eastern edge of Marion County, 15 miles from the Ohio State Marion campus. For eons, humans have been using the earth to build dwellings and shelters. For most of that time, it's been a labor-intensive process, making bricks one by one by hand. Many bricks, particularly those with unique shapes or characteristics, are still made by hand. But in Glen Gary's Iberia plant, brick making is a high-tech, state-of-the-art enterprise. 
shale from the deposit behind the plant is scooped into a crusher that reduces it to a fine powder. That powder is then augered into holding vessels mixed with additives like iron oxide to give the bricks their red color. The dry materials are sent to a mixing tank where they are mixed with a precise amount of water to form a pasty clay. The clay is pushed through an extruder that creates a continuous rectangle. The extrusion is cut into pieces, then cut again by fine wires into individual bricks. The newly formed bricks are stacked on a drying rack and sent into a drying oven where much of the water in the clay is removed. Only when they have reached the right degree of dryness are the bricks sent into Glen Gary's continuous kiln that heats them to temperatures of up to 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. At that temperature, the minerals in the clay undergo a chemical transformation, vitrification, fusing them together and resulting in the hardened material that is a finished brick. During the firing process, raw gas is inserted into the kiln, which gives those bricks exposed near the top of the stack a darker color than those farther down. To maintain a uniform assortment of colors, the bricks are hand sorted into shipping units so that as they are applied to a building, there will be an even mix of colors and textures. Finished bricks are sent to a storage yard and soon will be trucked to the building site. Skilled masons apply cement and make sure each brick is level and square. Weep holes are inserted into the finished brick facing to allow condensation to escape from behind the brick wall. When complete, the ancient shale formed in a time before dinosaurs or humans has become the new face of Ohio State Marion's science and engineering building. In 1951, as the Cold War blossomed, B.F. Goodrich needed a plant to make high-pressure hoses for use in, among other things, the Minuteman missiles that were being deployed around the country. They chose Green Camp. Goodrich proceeded to build what eventually became, by 1959, a 314,000-square-foot facility. It employed over 200. As the Cold War ended, the company was sold to Stratoflex and then Parker Hannafin. As offshoring took hold and places like China could build hoses cheaper, Parker Hannafin shuttered the operation in 2004, eliminating 200 union jobs. In 2017, the site was considered for a marijuana grow facility, but that project didn't materialize. Today, it houses ag equipment and the occasional bird and raccoon. Once known as the Shovel City and Lime City, and Little Chicago for its rail network. Marion, for seven or eight decades now, has been known as the popcorn capital of the world. We may have outlived that name at this point in time. At least five other cities claim the title as well. But let's go back to the beginning. May of 1936, to be exact, the country was emerging from the Great Depression. Even though she was the daughter of Marion Steam Shovel's president, Ava Brown and her farmer husband Hoover were looking for a way to bolster their farm income. They decided to plant a hundred acres of popcorn in a bold experiment to save their Wyandotte County farm. If they could process it, perhaps they could find a niche serving the growing movie business. The processing happened in the little schoolhouse the Brown boys had attended as children. The experiment was successful, and the company grew, processing raw popcorn, experimenting with various hybrids. The Browns added a four-story processing facility to the schoolhouse in 1944. As the movie industry grew in 1948, Wyandotte started a subsidiary, Popped Right Corn Company, on Mill Street in Marion to supply the movie houses with ready-to-eat corn. Popped Right also provided potato chip companies with a line of popcorn products and established Wyandotte as a major exporter of popcorn, shipping to 75 countries at one time and accounting for a quarter of the total global sales of popcorn. Caramel corn was added in 1950 in partnership with Hoover Brown's fellow entrepreneur and friend Bert Shirk of Shirk's Candies. Shirk developed the unique caramel recipe and golden crisp caramel corn was the result. 
Wyandotte and Popdright built a combined production plant on Wyandotte Avenue off North Main Street in 1964. The business grew to making corn-based snacks for grocery chains competing with Frito-Lay. In 1983, operations were combined under the name Wyandotte Inc. In 1989, the company sold the raw popcorn processing operation to ConAgra to focus on snack production. Tragedy struck on November 1, 1996, when fire destroyed the production facilities on Wyandotte Avenue. But the company promised to rebuild and kept all 300-plus employees on the payroll at 60% of their wages. With the help even of competitors making product for them, Wyandotte never missed an order. On July 1, 1997, less than a year after the fire, the plant was rebuilt and the first products rolled off the new lines. When Frito-Lay acquired the Cracker Jack brand, they wanted a new facility to produce it. Wyandotte's modern new plant fit the bill, so for 12 years, Wyandotte and Marion became the only place in the world where the iconic snack was produced. Today, Wyandotte continues as a contract manufacturer of corn-based snacks, but also new, better-for-you snacks using inputs such as chickpeas and other vegetable products. ConAgra, which bought the raw popcorn operations in 1989, also ramped up microwave popcorn production in the easternmost building at the Marion Industrial Depot on the east side of town, producing a billion packages of Act II, Orville Redenbacher, and Jiffy Pop microwave popcorn yearly. The Marion Popcorn Festival, Ohio's second largest festival behind Circleville's Pumpkin Show, truly represented a key industry in the area. However, ConAgra decided to consolidate, closing the microwave plant in 2014 and the raw corn processing operation in 2015. Wyandotte still pops some corn, but nowhere near the volume that the city produced in years past. 2021 will mark the 40th anniversary of the Marion Popcorn Festival. Is it time to rethink it? Maybe, given the importance of Whirlpool in our economy, the Marion Laundry Festival? Just saying. One of the community's oldest industries is Wilson Bohannon, named for its founder who started making brass padlocks in Baltimore in partnership with a Mr. Gibson, and then took up his profession in Brooklyn, New York in the mid-1800s after trying and failing to get rich in the 1849 California Gold Rush. In 1860, Bohannon and his son laid the foundation for the company at Broadway and Kossuth Place in Brooklyn. Today, the brass padlock maker is tucked away on Buckeye Street, next to the Norfolk Southern Railroad, again a Marion industry started by an outsider with an element of serendipity mixed in. Bohannon patented his design in 1860, one of nine patents he obtained, he delivered locks to the government for use in the Civil War. In 1888, the company grew to larger space on Lexington Avenue in Brooklyn. Even as early as 1880, Bohannon was shipping his locks all over the world, as far away as China and Australia. Eventually, Bohannon passed the company on to his only son, Wilson Todd Bohannon, who died in 1904. The next generation, Wilson Bohannon Tway, kept the company going, but decided in 1926 it had outgrown its Brooklyn location. Tway remembered getting off a troop train in Marion, where the local ladies fed the boys at a Red Cross canteen. He liked the feel of the place and remembered it when it was time to find a new home for his lock company whose main customers were the nation's railroads, so an early lesson in the importance of good first impressions. Today, Wilson Bohannon continues making thousands of brass padlocks, shipping them all over the world for use by utilities and others needing weather-resistant quality locks. A fifth generation of the family is now taking the reins of this Marion company that wouldn't be here but for a fortuitous whistle stop and a few smiles by some welcoming Marionites. Well, as often happens, success breeds imitation. Such was the case in 1969 when a small company in Prospect opened up making, imagine, brass padlocks, 
Hercules Industries employed 23 people before the coronavirus hit. The company makes locks similar to Wilson Bohannon, with revenues about 40% of the larger companies. Its ownership is considered minority, so it may gain points in securing government contracts. There are at least three other instances of duplicated effort among Marion's manufacturers. The earliest might be in the late 1800s. Fred Strobel joined Edward Huber in designing a grain separator and thresher that Huber manufactured and marketed very successfully. Apparently, wanting more credit and revenue for his inventiveness, in 1884, Strobel left Huber. Strobel, with several others, founded the Marion Manufacturing Company. The company produced threshers and traction engines very similar to Huber's under the leader name. By 1904, Strobel and the company officers were aging and left the company. One of the new officers was one 38-year-old Warren G. Harding, who served as president of the company. It was reorganized under New Jersey law, but by 1910, unable to keep up with its bigger competitors like the J.I. Case Company and the in-town rival Huber, Marion Manufacturing went bankrupt. Warren Harding was named trustee. The company was sold to Ohio Tractor Manufacturing Company, which continued to produce leader steam and gasoline kerosene tractors and road rollers until 1915, when the company went bankrupt again. It was then that production switched to Houghton hearses and motor trucks. Between 1902 and 1911, while Marion Steam Shovel was sending 112 shovels to Panama to help dig out the famous canal, the largest engineering project in the world up to that time, trouble was brewing in the front office. Sales manager Arthur Edgar Cheney had a disagreement with President George King. King wanted the company to focus on the bigger mining equipment, while Cheney thought he could better sell smaller shovels to the construction trades. The two parted ways, and Cheney and several others, including Harry J. Barnhart, the son of Marion Steam Shovel founder Henry Barnhart, set up the very similar-sounding Marion Steam Shovel and Dredge Company. In 1910, the new company bought the assets of the defunct Osgood Dredge Company from William Carmichael of Albany, New York. Carmichael was the nephew of William S. Otis, who invented the steam shovel in 1835 in Philadelphia for the Garrett and Eastwick Company. As might be expected, given the bad blood in Marion, similar names and similar products, the new company was sued by Marion Steam Shovel for trademark infringement. Well, the Cheney Group lost. By 1914, the new company was known simply as the Osgood Company. Osgood operated independently, selling its brand of Marion-made shovels until 1955. In that year, Osgood was purchased by Marion Power Shovel, and its lines incorporated into the bigger company, ironically fulfilling Cheney's view that Marion should be selling smaller construction-grade machines, as well as big mining shovels and drag lines. As if Osgood and Marion steam shovels weren't enough, there were even more produced in Marion. James G. Fairbanks, born in Geauga County in 1858, landed in Marion 20 years later after a machinist apprenticeship in Urbana. He went to work for Huber, where he rose through the ranks to become a superintendent. After 19 years with Huber, Fairbanks branched out on his own, starting Fairbanks Construction Company in 1893 and running a quarry on East George Street. Ten years later, in 1903, he raised $200,000 in capital to open Fairbanks Steam Shovel. New shops were built on 10 acres just north of the Marion Steam Shovel Works and just west of Leader Street. The plant was electrically driven, employing 300 in 1907. Fairbanks built dipper dredges, steam shovels, gasoline shovels, ditchers, sawmills, locomotive cranes, and Lobo traction engines, just like Huber, Leader, Marion Steam Shovel, and Osgood. With all of these companies combined, for over a century, Marion produced about 90% of the world's shovels and a significant portion of the civil engineering tools that built America in the 20th century. No wonder Marion became known as Shovel City.
Eventually, Fairbanks became General Excavator and Commercial Castings. Those companies became subsidiaries of Osgood, which again was swallowed by Marion Power Shovel in 1955. Seventeen miles up the road from Marion, in 1880, the Bucyrus Foundry and Manufacturing Company was founded, destined to become Marion Power Shovel's chief competitor. But within 13 years, the company was moved to South Milwaukee, when that town offered an industrial site and strong incentives, incentives the city of Bucyrus refused to match. Bucyrus mining equipment rivaled Marion's for size. To complete the circle, Bucyrus Erie, renamed Bucyrus International, eventually bought Marion Power Shovel in 1997. Then, in 2011, Caterpillar acquired Bucyrus for $8.8 .8 billion. With that purchase, Caterpillar acquired that long string of shovel history that started with William Otis in Philadelphia and ran through Marion, Ohio for the better part of the 20th century. Another recent example of copycat companies in Marion are Semco Tips and Hildreth Manufacturing, both making beryllium copper plunger tips used in the aluminum die casting industry. Semco is on Pole Lane Road and Hildreth is within walking distance at the north end of Cascade Drive. But let's go back for a moment to Fred Strobel, the inventor behind Marion Manufacturing and Leader Engines. Did you know, before we made dryers here in Marion, well before, we were making washing machines. Before Strobel joined up with Edward Huber, he invented an early washing machine and wringer dryer. Strobel's great-grandson described Fred as a character. Strobel obtained 16 patents for an eclectic batch of products in addition to his washer, a gasoline engine, a lawn swing, his Strobel manufacturing plant was west of Leader Street and eventually became part of Marion Manufacturing. But perhaps his most interesting invention was what we would call a small Ferris wheel. He called it the rotable pleasure wheel. The name certainly has a ring to it, don't you think? Strobel started making the small wooden portable wheels in 1885 and advertised them in farm magazines. The wheel was 25 feet in diameter and powered by a five horsepower gasoline engine. It had eight seats, often facing each other for quicker loading and unloading. The wheel could be hauled on one wagon and set up easily, quickly earning the operator the price of the wheel, $450, in just a few venues. Details are sketchy about how many wheels were made or sold, but Strobel's catalog claimed they were in operation at various county fairs, including Marion's, as well as the Ohio State Fair. And there is evidence it appeared at the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904. The building where Strobel and company made the Leader traction engines, tractors, and threshers still stands at the corner of Leader and Center Streets. One can still read, barely, some of the building's storied history on a 110-year-old paint on the building's south face. This one, with a little enhancement, says Kerosene Tractors. Can you guess what was advertised on the west side of the south wall? Leader Steam Engines and Rollers. This one took a little deciphering. There were numerous signs on this wall. Best we can determine, it said, Kerosene Road Roller, manufactured by the Ohio Tractor Manufacturing Company. That is the company out of Upper Sandusky that bought the rights to manufacture leader products. Following the leader chapter, the building was used by the Houghton Company to make motorized hearses and delivery trucks, and then by Marion Glass Manufacturing Company, which etched designs into glass tableware starting in 1925, turning out up to 19,000 finished glasses, vases, and bowls each day. That period in the middle of the Second Industrial Revolution, the first decade of the last century, saw huge industrial growth in Marion. Among the companies starting then, the Starner Copeland Shoe Manufacturing Company, started in 1904 by George Copeland and E.B. Durfee in a three-story brick factory on Park Boulevard at Darius Street.
The 180 employees made 25,000 pairs of ladies' and children's shoes each year, selling them domestically and in Europe. As sales fell, the company went out of business. The building was raised, and today is the site of a bulk oil facility. The Smith Mattress Company opened in 1889, making four mattresses a day, growing to 20,000 a year. Their curled horsehair mattresses were advertised as vermin-proof and non-absorbent. In addition to mattresses for home use, they supplied state hospitals and the hotel breakers at Cedar Point. Fire caused significant damage to the Blaine Avenue plant, but the company operated until the early 1950s. We made pianos. Starting in 1902 with $125,000 in stock, Noah Gebhardt started making high-end pianos in a brick plant at Grand Avenue and George Street. Gebhardt Pianos later became the Ackerman and Lowe Piano Company. When Ackerman and Lowe was finished, the plant was taken over by Houghton Sulky. In the midst of recession, Houghton sold the plant to the Cathedral Phonograph Company, which apparently couldn't make payments. The building then became the home of the Marion Tire and Rubber Company, which was bought by Studebaker Wolf Tires in 1922. That company ramped up production significantly until it, too, went bankrupt in 1929. Ultimately, the building that had made pianos, sulkies, records, and tires was raised. Marion wouldn't be Marion without saloons. All those guys making big machinery needed a place to go after a hard day's labor. In the early part of the last century, there were 49 pubs and saloons in town. And the Marion Brewing and Bottling Company, incorporated in 1894, was there to provide 8,000 barrels of beer a year to area taverns. Some described it as the best beer in the world. Well, just as COVID has shut down contemporary markets, the 1908 Rose Law allowed municipalities to shut down their taverns. Marion promptly shut all 49, and the market for Marion's Banquet Brew was wiped out. The brewery on Bell Fountain Avenue soon closed. The main building is gone, but the warehouse remains as a storage facility and a site for billboards. One of the more unique Marion companies around the turn of the last century was the Ohio Pulley Company, a maker of wooden pulleys. It was moved here by James Prendergast in 1897 as part of his Prendergast Lumber and Coal Company. In 1905, George W. King, president of Marion Steam Shovel, was listed as vice president. The pulleys could be used with traction engines and other large equipment. Some were as big as seven feet in diameter and were sold as far away as Sweden. A key selling point. They positively clamped the shaft. Hmm. Was subliminal advertising a thing back then, one wonders? It appears Ohio Pulley was out of business by 1907. The Susquehanna Silk Mill, built in 1902 partly from timbers that were culled from Bavaria's Black Forest, was part of the larger enterprise headquartered in New York. The mill made over a million yards of fine silks on 300 looms for ladies' garments and gentlemen's ties. Here is some of the equipment used by the mill's 700 employees. Most of Susquehanna Silk Mill's employees were women, some even staying in a boarding house on the site. After the silk mill closed up shop, the factory was bought by Howard Guthrie. His wife, Mildred, sold the building to Universal Cooler in 1943. The company made compressors for freezers, refrigerators, air conditioning, and other applications. Here are some of the applications for Universal Cooler compressors at a 1946 trade show in Cleveland. One of the more unique projects was making a water cooler for the Army's machine guns during World War II that allowed the guns to be fired at longer intervals during battle. The plant was bought in 1950 by Tecumseh Products, which got its start in Tecumseh, Michigan, as Hillsdale Machine and Tool Company. 
Founder Ray Herrick was helped by no less than Henry Ford, Harvey Firestone, and Thomas Edison, all friends of Warren Harding. Herrick had been in charge of production at Ford in the embryonic days of the automotive industry in Detroit, but believing the automotive industry could be fickle, he decided to start his own company, focusing on the new field of refrigeration in 1934. After taking over the Marion plant, the footprint grew. The company expanded into Kentucky, Tennessee, and Mississippi as air conditioning opened up in the South. A strike by Marion's 2,500 Tecumseh workers in June 1983, featuring at one point firebombs, sealed the fate of the Marion plant. It announced it was closing in January of 1984. Later, the plant, which featured a saw-toothed roof to let in natural light, housed associated hygienic products, which made baby diapers under the Dripers and store brand names. From fine silks to refrigeration compressors to baby's bottoms, the plant had quite a history. The Joseph Street plant closed in the mid-2000s as AHP decided to build a new facility in Delaware, closer to the new Kroger distribution center there. Well, despite the fact that Marion offered the company free land in the new dual rail industrial park, AHP has since been bought by Domtar, a Montreal, Canada-based fiber, pulp, and paper company. The site was bought by a speculator who sold off pieces of it and then abandoned the site. It was finally raised by the EPA in 2014. A large part of Marion's industrial history is about finding new uses for yesterday's facilities. The Leader Building at Leader and Center, for example, housing steam engine production, then glassware etching, and then Houghton hearses. Huber's facilities on Greenwood Street, making road graders, rollers, ag equipment, to today housing Simcoat, the company that coats rebar with weather-resistant epoxy for use in bridges and other structures. In the middle of the last century, on the west side, on West Center Street, west of the Marion Steam Shovel operations, stood the Union Stockyards, a livestock auction. On that site grew the Quaker Oats pet food facility that opened in 1946, making kennel ration and puss in boots wet dog and cat food. At its peak, the plant utilized 200 horses a day, many shipped up from the south. The poor old things at the end of their useful lives, corralled in the former auction corral, only to be herded into the plant where they were dispatched by a squad of rifle-toting marksmen, then turned into America's favorite dog food. The plant across Center Street, run by National Can, made the steel cans and shipped them across the street by an overhead conveyor. It is said by long-timers that old beer cans can still be found in the upper reaches of the kill room, where, to get through their gruesome task, the trigger men would relieve the stress of their job through fairly constant liquid libation. In later years, the dog food was made with beef byproducts instead of fresh slaughtered horses, and the plant established a dry dog food operation as well. Quaker announced it was closing the plant in July of 1989, citing declining markets. 390 lost their jobs in the gradual shutdown during the fall of that year and the spring of 1990. It wasn't long, however, before the facility was acquired and refitted into an operation that converts rolled paperboard into single wall packaging. Soap boxes, cereal boxes, and McDonald's french fry containers are just some of the products made by Graphic Packaging of Marion, one of Graphic Packaging International's 70-plus facilities worldwide. Little known but of major importance to modern sanitation was the invention of William F. Eric and Ralph A. Garverick in 1934. The two invented the first mechanized garbage packer truck. The technology was licensed to Marion Steel Body Company, later Marion Metal Products Company, on Cheney Avenue, which became a pioneer in the evolution of municipal refuse trucks. Later, the company added hydraulics to the mechanism, developing the Marion Hydropacka. Company founder Thomas H. Clark Sr. held patents for the dump truck bodies that he developed. 
As early as 1925, the company made dump bodies for early Ford trucks. As time went on, the company also made bottom dump hopper trailers and vertical lifts and even metal grave vaults. Marion Metal Products operated from the 1920s into the 1970s, eventually being sold and renamed Sycon Corporation. This one of their publications from 1960. In later years, the building was a storage facility for, among other things, Denison University's crew boats. The building was raised, and now the property is occupied by Nucor Steel. During World War II, Tom Clark Jr. and his father, Tom Sr., made small metal parts for the war effort in Tom Sr.'s garage. All told, the effort yielded $6,000, just enough for Tom Jr. and Sr. to start a small tool and die business when the war ended. Dad and son and a part-time apprentice were the only employees when Clark Metal Products was incorporated. As it grew, the company moved to new quarters at 370 West Fairground Street, building a clientele that included many Fortune 500 companies such as IBM, AT&T, and A.O. Smith. They made small metal stampings for office machines, computers, appliances, automobiles, and many more applications. During the Vietnam War, the Marion Company made 360 million small can openers that GIs used to open their K rations. Clark Metal was known for its precision. They were early adopters of computerized cutting machines in the 80s. At its peak, Clark Metal employed up to 90 skilled machinists, engineers, and tool and die employees. Leadership of the firm passed to Tom Clark III. As with many companies, however, competition from China became overwhelming in the 80s and 90s. The company was sold in 1998 to a conglomerate of half a dozen similarly sized firms. Bankruptcy of one of them took down the whole group. The building was eventually sold to Keith Warner, who moved his robotics firm, Robot Works, into the structure. Tom Clark III is still active in the Marion community. His brother, Gary, founded Clark Manufacturing, another metal products company in Traverse City, Michigan. As we've seen, much of Marion's industrial history has been involved in moving and processing bulk material, limestone, grain, aggregate, dirt, scrap metal, with shovels, excavators, threshers, tractors. Another significant Marion company in this field was Fairfield Engineering Company, ironically named for the county where the company started, but it spent only two of its 85 years there. As we've seen with so much of Marion County's industry, Fairfield started with an inventor who developed a way to mechanize a labor-intensive process. Henry Walker of Lancaster was that inventor. The process was coal handling. In 1919, most homes were heated with coal that needed to be shoveled from rail cars to delivery wagons to coal bins to furnaces. Walker invented a conveyor that mechanized much of that process. Unfortunately, the Lancaster shop where he made them burned in 1921, two years after he started his company. Marion leaders, including Henry True, heard about Walker's misfortune and offered to buy stock in his company and give him land for a new shop on Barnhart Street in Marion, if he'd agreed to locate here and hire a certain number of people. The incentives were right and Walker came to town, landing at 324 Barnhart Street in 1921. Eight years later, more misfortune, the 1929 stock market crash and resulting depression. But that's when the company decided to expand into a systems approach, where they would customize a series of conveyors, scales, and other equipment to handle materials at, for example, utility plants, cement plants, ports, steel mills, and other industries. Fairfield, a combination of engineering expertise and a fabrication plant, grew into wood handling and even through a subsidiary, Fairfield Services, wastewater treatment handling.
The company helped build Chicago's wastewater handling system and was told that once its equipment even caught a car traveling through Chicago's massive sewers. At its height, Fairfield employed about 400 engineers, fabricators, office personnel, and sales reps. But markets change, globalization brought in lower cost competitors, and Fairfield went out of business in 2004 after three generations of Walker management and expertise. Today, Marion's industrial picture is as diverse as it ever was, if not more so. Modern industrial centers include the Marion Industrial Center, the Dual Rail Industrial Park, the Airport Industrial Park, Cascade Drive, Cheney Avenue, and West Center Street from Union Station to Whirlpool. A word about the Marion Industrial Center and Ted Graham. For the last four and a half decades, Ted and his partners have kept the faith in Marion's potential and invested significantly in the buildings and infrastructure that made Marion great in their first incarnation. Ted bought the former Army Engineer Depot on the east side of town in 1975, seeing potential despite the falling in ceilings and collapsing walls. Over a million and a half square feet of space that could be purposed for any number of companies and nearly 10 miles of rail track were the catalyst for what today is a thriving multi-use home for various companies. The Mills Company, for example, makes lockers and commercial bathroom fixtures. Boise Cascade stores lumber for distribution throughout Ohio and surrounding states. The depot, as the Marion Industrial Center is often called, has stored cars of many makes and models, hosted an intermodal terminal, staged pipelines, and manufactured billions of bags of microwave popcorn. And lately, the eastern building of the Marion Industrial Center has become the distribution center for all the Mexican beer consumed in Ohio and surrounding states. Flexibility and a can-do spirit are what make things happen. Ted and his company also purchased the former Marion Power Shovel properties, both at Center and David Street, and on the south side of Marion at Barks and Cheney Avenue. These are heavy industrial buildings. They boast all kinds of crane capacity, enough to lift 300 tons if need be without collapsing the building. These are the buildings that built the NASA crawlers. Today, they serve Union tank cars' efforts to retrofit the nation's fleet of rail tankers. The same formula Ted used at the depot has made these buildings functional again. That is, invest in new floors, new roofs, new truck docks. Make these century-plus buildings functional in today's marketplace. Perhaps one of the more unique companies to be attracted to these buildings is a Canadian firm, Enterra Feeds. They will use corn that's been processed through Marion's Poet Ethanol facility to feed black soldier fly larvae. The worms, if you will, will then be dried and turned into protein supplements for use in animal feeds, a creative and entirely different use for a building that made some of the largest machines in the world, including the giant cannons for the Army. Across Cheney Avenue from Ted Graham's south side property is Nucor Steel. The building started as Interstate Steel, which in 1915 was enticed to move to Marion from Cambridge, Ohio, by $60,000 in seed money to build the new facility. Within a few years, it became Pollock Steel, then Armco, then Marion Steel, and now Nucor, the plant makes rebar and signposts employing about 400. Nucor has invested heavily in the century-old mini-mill, putting $85 million lately into a new continuous rolling mill and safety equipment. Follow the railroad tracks north of town to where the Evans and Norris and Christian quarries were, and you'll find Marion's Dual Rail Industrial Park. 433 acres was acquired through a state grant to Marion Can Do, our economic development nonprofit. 
The idea was to develop the potential to link the Norfolk and Southern and CSX railways into a unique industrial setting where companies could, if they wanted to, enjoy the ability to ship and receive by either or both of these two Class I railroads that serve the eastern United States. The first project to locate in the dual rail industrial park was LTV Steel's new welded tube mill. Now Arcelor Middle Steel, the Marion plant makes tubing used in the automotive and oil industries, among others. Two Honda suppliers located in the park in short order, U.S. Yachio makes plastic fuel tanks in a robotic blow molding operation. And Marion Industries, now Piston Automotive, makes brake assemblies. Both plants opened around 2000. Japanese forging equipment maker Sakamura built a plant on seven acres in the park in 2001 to service and supply parts for the company's hot and cold forging machines located across the U.S. and Canada. The dual rail industrial park created a modern, beautiful setting for new industries designed to counter Marion's old industry reputation with a park featuring robust infrastructure, beautiful landscaping, and the unique advantage of competing rail service. In 2002, Silverline Windows and Doors was looking for a location for a new 300,000 square foot vinyl window production facility first attracted by the former Anheuser-Busch recycling plant seen here on Cascade Drive, company officials soon realized they would need a bigger footprint. Silverline needed rail, easy access to a four-lane highway, and given the company's corporate jet travel, access to an airport that could land a Cessna Citation jet. The city's airport industrial park, at that time just a concept on paper, fit the bill. A combination of grants and incentives got a new road built to the east end of the park, a new taxiway built off the runway, a rail spur and utilities extended to the new plant, which employs about 600 people. Silverline is now owned by Plygem, a division of Cornerstone Building Brands, one of the largest building products companies in the U.S. Opening up the Marion Airport Park has led to several more plants locating there. Marion has two box converters and manufacturers. One is the Royal Group, located on Innovation Drive in the Airport Industrial Park. The other is International Paper, maintaining operations on Cascade Drive, making corrugated cardboard and boxes. The former Anheuser-Busch plant, also owned by Graham Investments, is now part of Sika Corporation, a Swiss-owned specialty chemical company. In Marion, Sika makes concrete admixtures and adhesives, including the caulking around the Lincoln Memorial Reflecting Pool in Washington. Sika also makes the glue that holds the windshield on your car. Poet Biorefining found a home in Marion for their plant that makes 150 million gallons of ethanol a year out of much of Ohio's corn crop. Adjacent to the CSX Railroad on Hillman Ford Road, the Poet plant was recently doubled in size. The former Clark Metal stamping plant found a new use several years ago when a company called Robot Works landed there. Robot Works was founded by OSU-trained welding engineer Keith Wanner. His unique idea was to sell refurbished and new industrial robots via the Internet. Warner found a niche in the move to advanced automation. He sold the company in 2014 to New Zealand-based Scott Technology. Marion's unique mix of educational institutions today provide newly minted engineers, technicians, and thinkers into the Marion economy. Our adaptability has led us to be the Lime City, Shovel City, and the popcorn capital of the world. And now we're calling ourselves America's workforce development capital. Whatever we're calling ourselves at any given moment, the truth is Marion has always had a creative and talented industrial base.
With new industrial parks and reuse of existing facilities, Marion and Marion County have ample capacity for more and varied companies. Companies are spawned and companies die. Today's industrial snapshot isn't yesterday's, nor will it be tomorrow's. However, Marion County's well-earned reputation for innovation and a can-do industrial workforce will likely secure our future for another 200 years. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed this review of Marion County's industrial heritage on this, the 200th anniversary of Marion County's founding.